Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's episode of Global Crisis, Global Solidarity, a new bi-weekly discussion show brought to you by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and its Center for International Dialogue. The Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung is one of the major political foundations in Germany, promoting political education and research in the spirit of our namesake, the iconic socialist leader, Rosa Luxemburg. And with offices in 25 countries around the world, we see ourselves as a facilitator of interaction and exchange between labor and lift forces in Germany, Europe, and around the globe. Every first and third Wednesday of the month, a Global Crisis Global Solidarity invites thinkers, activists, academics, and partners of the foundation to discuss the current aspect or uh, uh, the local, regional, and global aspects of the current crisis, as well as to take a serious look at what kinds of strategies would an international lift, internationalist lift offer in response. My name is Fidel Zanin, and to, I'll, I'll be hosting today's episode. For the last few years, the Green New Deal, or the GND, has been the watchword of large parts of the international left, envisioning a massive state-funded overhaul global economy that, that seeks like to go towards sustainable production and agriculture. It was crucial to the visions put forward by Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn and gave millions hope that there was a viable alternative to neoliberal capitalism and climate catastrophe in the near to medium term. Some critics argue, however, the GND fails to take the realities in the global south into account, specifically the amount of rare metals and resources that would need to be extracted from the ground in order to build the renewable infrastructure that underpins the, G the GND. Today we would like to know more, can these interests be reconciled? Can we envision a world that is environmentally sustainable, but also socially just? We will be speaking today with Marcel Vamba of the Pacto Eco Social del Sur, a new Latin American initiative based around similar principles of the GND, but with a distinct, distinct emphasis on the global south. Marcella Svampa is a sociologist, a writer. She currently lives in Buenos Aires and works as a senior researcher at the National Scientific and Technical Research Council. And she is a full professor at the National University of La Plata. Her work is centered around the socio-ecological crisis and social movements and social theory. So, Marcella, thank you for being here today. You have lived through one of the worst economic crises in Latin America, the economic crisis in Argentina between 1998 and 2002. Crises devastate nations, but they potentially open a window of opportunity for change and uh, transformation. How did you experience the Argentinian crisis and what is the situation today in Argentina and 20 years after the economic depression and now facing the coronavirus pandemic? Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, Fida. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you to the Rosa Luxemburg uh, Foundation for this possibility. Um, concerning the first question, uh, yes, I, I know that uh, all great crises uh, trigger very ambivalent and contradictory demands. Uh, the demands uh, for transformation, uh, for solidarity, and demands for order and return to normalcy. Uh, when the pandemic started here in Argentina, we were in a very serious, serious economic situation, uh, boosted by a huge, a huge external debt. Uh, with uh, President Mauricio Macri, in 2015, Argentina returned to neoliberal policies, adjustment and tariff, uh, a high inflation, a decline in real wages. Uh, to make a matter worse, in May 2018, the Argentine government signed an agreement with uh, AMF, 
that granted the largest loan in the history. Bear in mind that in 2019, tectonic plates moved in Latin America, especially in Bolivia, it was a coup d'etat. Uh, in Ecuador and Chile, there were uh, major revolts against adjustment policies. If in Argentina there were no similar revolts, it is because there was a political expectation about the outcome of elections which finally gave the victory to a wide uh, alliance of different current, currents of Peronism with uh, some center-left uh, parties, uh, led by Alberto Fernandez and Cristina Fernandez de, de Kirchner. Um, facing the pandemic, uh, looking at the experience of European countries, Alberto Fernandez announced the lockdown early, very early, in March. Preventive confinement applied throughout uh, the national territory uh, gave the government extra time to strengthen the health structure. The fact was uh, well received uh, by the society uh, after two, uh, 220 days of confinement. Today uh, we celebrate uh, 120 days of confinement. So uh, all that accentuated economic problems and territorial inequalities. Starting in May, the contagion curve hit very strong in Buenos Aires and Greater Buenos Aires, which concentrate 37% uh, uh, of the country's population with uh, high poverty and unemployment rates. So uh, large cities uh, became a death trap, especially for vulnerable population overcrowded and deprived of basic services. So at this moment, the situation is becoming increasingly unsustainable due to its economic and health impacts. Thanks a lot, Marstella. Discussing the future, or to be more specific, discussing the future from an Argentinian perspective, where fossil fuel today represents 85% of the Argentinian energy mix. How can a system that goes beyond fossils be built? Do you think, is it possible in, in 20 years that we see a society based on clean and renewable energy in Argentina? Well, it's very complicated because I think it is time for Argentina to begin a socio-ecological transition this implies uh, both transition and transformation, moving to the energy system based uh, on clean, renewable energy. This uh, has not been possible, among other reasons, because Baca Muerta, which is the second or third largest unconventional hydrocarbon field, has updated Ad El Dorado imagery. Baca Muerta has closed the possibility of a discussion about alternative and sustainable sources of energy in the name of promise of development uh, or promise uh, to become a great hydrocarbon uh, exporting power. Since 2012, Argentina has promoted Baca Muerta with very few results uh, compared to other hydrocarbon deposits in the world. The state has subsidized oil companies. In fact, this mega project is not only unsustainable in the social environmental terms, but also economically unviable. Now uh, we are witnessing a spectacular crash in the value of oil barrel we are witnessing the bankruptcy of fracking consensus. Uh, this collapse in the oil price should uh, take apart the fracking consensus shared by the political and economical elites here in Argentina and buries uh, the El Dorado meat. Uh, at the same time, it should open up an opportunity for a total rethinking of the energy system but it wasn't the case. 
I, I know, uh, I, I, I realize that the Argentine government has signed an agreement with oil companies establishing a special price, a Creole barrel, uh, a Creole, uh, sorry, a Creole barrel at uh, $45 when the international price was, was at, that, at that moment, uh, $30 or $32. So uh, finally, it, uh, it may be utopian to think that Argentina could be sourcing 100% of its energy from renewable by 2014, uh, uh, 2040, sorry. But I think that is, that is the direction that the country must take. At the same time, we need to move forward in terms of democratization as energy is a human right. And one of the main tasks is to finish with, with the energy poverty so uh, I think that social justice and environmental justice must go hand in hand. Yes, thanks a lot, Marstel. Uh, I'd like to uh, dive deep into that, but first I'd like to go to another point. The Green New Deal proposals are being debated today around the globe, in the US by AOC and Bernie Sanders, in the UK by Jeremy Corbyn and uh, Anne Paddy Ford, whom we had a few months ago in the program with us. In Latin America, it is the social, ecological, economical and intercultural pact for Latin America. It is repre represented as a holistic plan that would save planet and at the same time would save lives, but also would radically reshape our relationship to uh, Mother Nature or to the nature. Before we go deep into the details of the pact, I'd like to know how and why did the concept of the Great uh, Pact arose? Um, with uh, Enrique Viale, an Argentine colleague, uh, an uh, environmentalist lawyer, we finished a book in February whose title is The Ecological Collapse is Here. And uh, there are two chapters in which we talk about the transition, we talk about the eco-social pact in Argentina, and uh, we talk about the, the, the link between social and uh, environmental justice. Uh, when the pandemic started uh, in April, we decided to publish it and to give it more content, more specific content. In June, we worked with other Latin American colleagues and activists, and we presented the eco-social and intercultural pact from the South. Uh, why now? Because the pandemic set us up against new political, economic, social, and ethical dilemmas. It has shown the failure of the globalized, uh, globalization model. On the one hand, uh, it has exposed social and economic and, and ethnic inequalities. It has also shown a social decline that encompasses the health uh, systems, uh, the food uh, production, and the degradation of urban habitat, especially in relation to the most uh, vulnerable sectors. On the other hand, so we know the pandemic also has social environmental origins so uh, we 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 are aware that we cannot we cannot return to false uh, solutions that will further accentuate inequalities and will uh, lead to a collapse of the ecosystems in a capitalist context where we are witnessing the expansion of the extreme right so we consider that, our, that we are in a moment of dispute of meanings and uh, without falling uh, into a naive or linear vision, we should give a global response uh, from the South. Uh, we should uh, point to other horizons in the fight of the sustainability of life. Uh, but uh, it's important to say that in any case, either in the pact in its uh, Argentine version, uh, nor in its Latin American version, it's an abstract proposal. But rather, the pact 
reflects the accumulation of the struggles, the processes of uh, re-existence, the concept created in the recent decades uh, by the social movement. Uh, for example, uh, rights of nature, uh, good living or buen vivir, uh, just uh, transition, uh, paradigm of care, agroecology, uh, food sovereignty, post-extractivism, uh, autonomy, among others. So, uh, finally, this is not a, a Latin American version uh, of Green New Deal. It's, uh, it's an eco-social, economic, and intercultural pact from the South. Of course, uh, there is a dialogue from the very beginning with those who from the North, uh, in terms of the Green New Deal, uh, we share the fact uh, that our proposals are not uh, exclusively green agenda, but rather uh, comprehensive uh, agendas that articulate social justice with ecological justice, ethnic and gender justice. Thanks, Marcel. I, I can talk about the, 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 the axis if you want. Yes. The uh, axis. Yeah, so that, that, that leads me to my next question. Uh, you have already mentioned that the pact seeks to connect social justice, environmental justice, and also gender justice. So it is sensitive to the intersectional nature of oppression and exploitation. I, I would like to hear more from you. Uh, what are the main pillars? of the uh, uh, pact and how do they align? Yes, it's not a short answer <laughs> uh, because it's very complicated um, to explain that, but uh, the pact has uh, three, three important axes. Uh, first, a, a, a paradigm of care. Second, a social and redistributive agenda. And third, a socio-ecological transition. So the first is a paradigm of care because um, we need we need to transform the relationship between uh, society and nature. We need to overcome the dualistic and anthropocentric paradigm to replace it with a rela relational paradigm which places interdependence and care at the center. Uh, I think that the great contribution of uh, feminism, ecofeminism, uh, um, and like that of indigenous peoples is their radical commitment to placing the sustainability of life, of life at the center. Um, in short, in, uh, for this point, uh, we propose uh, to, place, to place care in all orders and dimensions of life. Uh, for example, to promote uh, a democratic distribution, distribution of domestic tasks, to care, uh, to take care of dependent people. You know, in Latin America, care work exacerbates uh, gender inequalities, falls on family and within family, uh, on, we, on women, especially on poor women. But care concerns uh, also the relationship uh, with ecosystems, with ter territory, with agriculture. Uh, care finally concerns health, education, work, uh, and uh, all that uh, disappear, uh, this, sorry, this, this appears more relevant in the current context of a pandemic and requires a biggest involvement uh, or bigger involvement of the state through public policies and the rebuilding of health uh, systems. It is important to connect care, health and environment in order to face the challenges of climate change and most likely the pandemics to come. The second point is regarding to the, to the social agenda, because um, uh, remember, Latin America continues to be the most unequal region in the world. And we have uh, a regressive uh, uh, tax systems. So the first, uh, uh, the first proposition or the first proposal 
uh, it's uh, to reform uh, to reform the tax systems uh, based on the principle of who has more pays more who has less pays less this uh, should include taxes on inheritance extreme wealth mega corporations financial earnings and as a transitional measure damage to the environment this uh, should be connected with the uh, with a universal basic income we know uh, the universal basic income is in the center of the global debate now even in latin america iclac iclac is a uh, economical commission for latin america recommended such a policy to latin american governments uh, in latin america uh, there are the focus and fragmented social policies so we can uh, we, we have to to propose an, a basic income not linked to wage employment uh, wage, um, uh, basic uh, basic income does not reinforce the poverty trap or clientelism does not require any condition or any consideration in return and aims to guarantee a sufficient floor for the access to the basic uh, consumption and the third point connected with the social agenda is obviously uh, debt jubilee no? we need we, we need the debt uh, jubilee because no country can pay colossal external debt uh, without a first uh, guaranteeing or guaranteeing its uh, inhabitants a decent life, much less in this context of global and national economic recession, much less in a situation of almost default that some countries inherit, like Argentina. Last but not least is uh, the, the socio-ecological transition, because uh, we need to build post-extractivist economies and society. We need uh, a radical socio-ecological transition, move away from dependence on oil, coal and gas, and mining, deforestation, and large-scale uh, monocultures. We need to shift to renewable energy systems that are decentralized, decommodified, and democratic. Although the resource is available, as in the case of Vaca Muerta in Argentina, the impacts of fossil fuels linked to climate change set an ecological limit. So we, we, we must reduce the risk of climate change, a threat more serious than the pandemic, as demonstrated by floods, drought, landslide and forest fires we need to prioritize food sovereignty latin america is the region with the highest level of land concentration in the world so the the priority must must be to develop uh, policies aimed at land redistribution access to water and a sweeping reform of agrarian policies moving away uh, from industrial and agricultural for export. Now the dominant, agro, uh, the dominant model is agrobusiness model, uh, which requires lighter labor, uh, depend, uh, depends on agrochemicals, destroy uh, native forests and produce uh, fodder for livestock. Uh, and this model is increasingly questioned due to its concentration, and sustainability and its health impact. Argentina, for example, is the in Argentina, is the, the agrobusiness model is the biggest uh, socio environmental and health problem. Uh, Argentina is the largest consumer of the glyphosate in the world. So we need to prioritize uh, uh, agroecological farming agroforestry, uh, fishing, uh, small scale farming, and urban agriculture, and promoting the dialogue between different knowledge. Uh, we need to protect, uh, now, uh, we need to protect the cultural and biological 
diversity. So uh, that, uh, that is uh, the, the, the three important axes, care, social agenda, and socio-ecological transition. Thanks a lot, Maristella, for the very profound and detailed answer of the question. Now I'd like to know, can you tell us uh, some more about who are the main organizations and actors behind the pact right now? Mm. Yes, um, we are having a conversation for, with numerous uh, social movements in Latin America. The eco-social and intercultural pact uh, was signed by uh, 3,000 uh, 3, people, as well as uh, 400 social organizations from several countries, from Colombia, uh, Bolivia, Brazil, uh, um, e Ecuador, Argentina, obviously. Uh, in Argentina, we talk with several social environmental organizations, even uh, labor organizations and some politicians from socialist uh, parties. The Parliament of the province of Mendoza, for example, uh, declared the eco-social and intercultural pact as legislative interest. The pact was signed by many people from the cultural field, too. Um, at the moment, for example, uh, in Argentina especially, we work in a new, in a new campaign against uh, the, um, the house boundary farmers because the Argentine governments want uh, to sign an a strategic association with China in order to produce pork uh, meat to export to China. And we know, we know uh, that there is a connection between zoonotic viruses, animal husbandry farm, and the pandemics. So, uh, in fact, uh, in, um, in some, uh, this pact, this pact is not closed. It's very dynamic. Uh, it's not a list uh, of demands addressed uh, of, to the governments. It's an invitation to build uh, collective ideas, uh, share a path uh, to social change, provide a frame, a general frame uh, for shared struggles in all the different sectors of our society. Uh, so it's an invitation to put forward proposal for legislation, place visitas, and many other strategies in order to promote uh, this transition agenda. Yes, and um, you have already mentioned uh, uh, or repeatedly uh, mentioned that uh, COVID-19 is only a symptom of uh, of the wider, a wider problem worldwide, namely the destructive development policies. Could you elaborate more what uh, does that phrase uh, mean? And uh, can you explain how the pact would help in that case? Yeah. Yes, it's very important because the pandemic also has social environmental origins, although it tends to make them invisible. As numerous studies indicate, there is a strong, strong association between health crisis and socio-ecological crisis. Zoonotic so, viruses such as COVID-19 find uh, multiple environmental causes, including indiscriminate deforestation, wildlife trafficking, and large scale, uh, sorry, large scale animal husbandry farms. Uh, Robert Wallace, a biologist who has studied a century of pandemics for 25 years, says that all infectious viruses in, rec in recent decades are closely related to industrial animal husbandry. Other, uh, other side, deforestation, this phenomenon is documented in many countries uh, from uh, Southeast Asia to Latin America. Uh, however, uh, there is a common thing. There is an extractive vision of the living world which uh, leads humanity to an ecological collapse. Uh, we are witnessing 
a major uh, anthropocentric and socioge sociogenic change at a planetary scale. We, we talk about Anthropocene. That is connected with the increase of the social metabolism of, the, of capital at this phase, a moment of advanced capitalism, which need, which demand uh, more raw materials and extreme energies. The expansion of neo-extractivism is connected with this model of production, this model of extraction and consumption. This, uh, this uh, metabolic profile, uh, which, uh, which uh, become uh, uh, increasingly unsustainable. So our pack, I think, is an opportunity to pay attention, to pay attention uh, to the socio-ecological crisis and to think about the link that exists with this crisis, neo-extractivism and model of development. Yes, um, thanks Marstella. Uh, you have already uh, said or mentioned that the pact is not the new Green Deal of Latin America, but it's the pact. However, the GND and the Great Pact both aim at realizing socio-ecological transformation and are committed to mobilizing efforts towards uh, that aim. So can you explain to us what differences between the Green New Deal and the Great Pact and why was, uh, why was it uh, specifically needed in Latin America? What are the differences? Yeah, yes. One, on the one hand, in Latin America, we have never had a new deal, nor a Marshall Plan. So there is no imagery of national reconstru uh, reconstruction here linked to this kind of program. Uh, maybe in Argentina there is an imagery of social agreement linked to Peronism, eh, in which the demand for reparation, social justice, is linked is linked with a hegemonic idea of economic growth. So with extractive uh, extractive uh, extractive uh, model. So there are not imagery that is important linked to the New Deal. On the other hand. Um, we are aware that uh, our problems are different from those in the North, that there are strong historical and political asymmetries. We are aware that in the heat of the socio-ecological uh, crisis and the increase in social metabolism of capital, the ecological debt of the North has increased uh, exponentially in relation to the South as shown by the expansion of neo-extractivism in recent decades. So the social and ecological debt from north to south is not uh, covered, is not included in the Green New Deal, I think. There is not a geopolitical reflection that points out to a new global architecture, more just and solidarious. On this line of reasoning, when some people talk about the green transition from the north, there is a danger. There is a danger that the socio-ecological transition can be financed by the territory and population of the south. We have to pay attention to this trend, to this trend of repetition of the history. We, 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 we have other problems, more inequalities, bad development, uh, and, 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 and the temptation to the false uh, solutions. For example, now in the South, uh, there is a lithium, the lithium tri triangle with Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina. We cannot accept the false solution. Uh, we, we need to discuss lithium because in the current context of lithium transnationalization, it is very likely that we will end up financing the energy transition of other countries, richest countries, while destroying our territory and dispossessing uh, indigenous population. So we, we have to pay attention to false uh, solution when we talk about the green tran transition. Um, to and finally, yes. Uh, 
Oh, sorry, sorry. But uh, finally, yes, we, we need a, an, eco an eco-social and intercultural uh, pact connected with uh, the demands of autonomy uh, from the uh, uh, indigenous people and Afro-Latino American people. So we have or we should to uh, strengthen the economic, uh, political and cultural self-determination of this uh, kind of people. Um, definitely. And uh, to follow up on that, uh, Marstella, what challenges uh, do face the implementation of the Southern Eco-Social Pact and what stands in the way of reaching sovereign and inclusive uh, development model in Latin America? Yeah, uh, it's, 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 not, it's not easy uh, to answer uh, this question because uh, uh, one challenge is to change the international uh, division of labor, of course, uh, and our insertion as country that export nature, that consolidated extractive models. Now, a uh, free trade agreement uh, consolidated this kind, this kind of model. For example, free, uh, free trade, uh, uh, Mercosur, uh, European country, or uh, this uh, agreement, uh, this association with China. Don't I talk? Uh, uh, I talked before. So uh, there are there are a, a lot of uh, problems with uh, with uh, link with this kind of insertion in the international division of labor no and the second uh, the, the second problem or the second issue is um we have other challenges uh, cultural challenges uh, because for the for the last decade many governments in latin america have wanted to make us believe that there was an opposition between social and environmental issues, and that the environmental demands are a claim for integrated or wealthy sectors. And that is a, is a, is a mistake, it's an ideological mistake, because who people, people who suffer the most from environmental damage are the most vulnerable sectors, not only because they live in areas exposed to highly polluting sources, but also because they don't have the economic and human resources to face the consequences and resist the extractivism and the impact produced by climate change. Poverty maps usually coincides with maps of in environmental degradation in Latin America. And, and, and it, there is another second problem. Uh, during, the, uh, during the commodities boom uh, in the latest decade, neo-extractivism and environmental predation uh, sought to justify in the name of development, in the name of the reduction of inequalities. However, at the end of the progressive cycle, we have realized that uh, there, are, um, there have been no changes in the productive structures. On the contrary, regardless of the political color of governments, there, uh, there was a process of reprimarization of the economy in Latin America. We also know, uh, know that an important part of the economic growth in Latin America during the commodity boom was captured by the richer sectors of the society. So there, 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 there were not a reduction of inequalities. So, so um, we, uh, you know, we have uh, we have to discuss uh, not only uh, or, or not only uh, against uh, or we have to fight uh, not only against the, to the dominant vision uh, to the dominant liberal thought, but also we have to fight the persistent 
epistemic blindness associated with the progressive, with the left vision. That is a problem, it's a big problem. I think in Latin America, that is the problem to, uh, to discuss in the public agenda about this uh, proposal which links social and uh, ecological environmental issues. Um, yes, thanks. I don't uh, know if it, it was clear. It was very clear, Marcella. Thank you. It was really very clear. Uh, speaking of another uh, issue, like uh, it is considered or the age of colonialism uh, is considered over. However, colonial dynamics still dominate relations between the North and the South. And those, those dynamics can be seen clearly in the in trade market relations, uh, corporate monopoly, and also that the patterns of production and consumption. And you have already mentioned uh, uh, the free trade. In addition to the Western development uh, policies that and ideas that are considered progressive uh, at home, but they are really destructive and exploitive abroad. What can Europe do from its side to restructure the global trade relations and reverse the immense disparities uh, of economic and social and political power relations between the global south and the global north? Yes, it's, the, it's a very important moment to, to discuss a big problems in our societies, in our world. Uh, we must uh, reformulate the, the financial and commercial architecture at a global level, questioning the existence to the World Trade Organization itself, responsible for this model of globalization, which, which leads uh, to a crossroads that endangers our existence and life of the planet and increases inequality and the concentration of wealth. At this moment, at, the, at this moment, I think that is, is necessary, for example, to, to cancel the external debt of countries in the global south. It would be a first step toward historical reparation for the ecological and social debt built up by the industrialized countries since colonial times. We need to, to advance uh, in the socio-ecological transition together, together, not separate, separately. And for this, the country of the South require, uh, require great help from the North, uh, the urgent transfer of economic resources and clean and renewable technologies with an, uh, a unique and precious goal, the sustainability of life, a dignif a dignified life. Going back to uh, speak more about the pact, I'm really interested in knowing more about uh, the legal recognition of the rights uh, of nature, or what you the call rights the nature, rights of yes. nature. And apparently, the rights of nature is at the core of the pact. Could you uh, tell us more about uh, what does this phrase mean, the rights of nature? And uh, what other alternatives or approaches the pact offers to move uh, past extract uh, extractivism? It's a good point, because uh, we are convinced that a fundamental part of the eco-social and intercultural pact is the legal recognition of the rights of nature. A human being must uh, admit nature as a subject of rights. Uh, when we talk about the uh, rights of nature, that's not only mean abandoning an, an idea of conquest, colonization, and exploitation of uh, Mother Earth, but it also poses a deep change uh, that questions all the dominant and anthropocentric uh, paradigm, uh, anthropocentric logics. It, uh, it, 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 it forces us uh, to think about other life options, to begin with uh, the degrowth of uh, consumption model, uh, the, democratic, uh, the democratic construction of more humane and uh, sustainable societies. But uh, um, 
it's important to say, the universal recognition of the rights of nature does not imply a virgin uh, nature, but the integral respect uh, of, the, of its existence, uh, of its life uh, cycles, structure, function, and evolutionary processes. Um, there is another point. Uh, the Anthropocene as a crisis is also an urbanocene, especially in Latin America, because Latin America, um, in Latin America, 80% of the population lives uh, in, uh, in, in cities. Uh, the world uh, average is uh, 44 uh, percent. In Argentina, is 92 percent. 92 percent we in uh, we inhabit in in, in cities. Uh, we inhabit cities planned by uh, and for real estate speculation and dominated by the automobile um, dictatorships. So we. We must uh, ruralize uh, urbanity, especially in large city, in large cities where the relationship with uh, nature is practically nil. We must repair the separation that urban inhabitants have uh, regarding nature, also about the sources of our food and our life. Speaking of uh, resources of food and life, uh, food sovereignty is also at the core of the pact. And beyond the short, the short term of uh, beyond the short term consequences of the global coronavirus pandemic, it also threatens to generate a, a prolonged food crisis in Latin America. So, food security of millions living in Latin America is at stake. And the pandemic has revealed that the, that the fragility of the global production chains is really there. On the bright side, uh, we have heard and seen that a wide range of local and national efforts and initiatives in Latin America were launched promoting food sovereignty. Could you tell us a bit more about those initiatives locally and in Latin America? And what was uh, or what is the state right now of uh, agri-food system in Latin America these days? Yes, yes, it, it, it is true that the health crisis uh, can translate into a food crisis because uh, people get sick uh, and uh, people must leave uh, their fields, uh, uh, like in, in Central America, in Venezuela is a big crisis. Uh, let, me, uh, let me tell you uh, 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 about a, a recent report produced by, uh, by a working group on popular economics in Latin America from Claxo uh, that concern uh, this topic, that, th this issue. Uh, they talk um, about, that is true, the pandemic has hit popular sectors, but also has made uh, visible collective, proce uh, collective processes of uh, organization, solidarity practices, at uh, networks and mutual care. Uh, some of these uh, dynamics already existed and others have been created on a daily basis, uh, having a key role of the pandemic, especially by the indigenous and feminist uh, networks for food, for cleaning, for health, uh, care. Uh, bear, in the, uh, bear in mind that in several countries, community organizations are uh, in dialogue, in important dialogue, dialogue with governments, with the governments. At the same time, they have, uh, or, or they are autonomous, they have a self-managed infrastructure. Uh, in, in Argentina and in Ecuador, for example, there were some uh, demonstrations uh, of solidarity from rural and peasant organizations who produce uh, healthy food and promote uh, community solutions with uh, urban and popular sectors in the cities affected uh, 
affected by the COVID-19. Uh, don't forget uh, that in, uh, in Latin America, there are a lot of worker, informal workers. Six out of 10 workers uh, work in the informal sector. So it's a very important problem. So it's for that we need a universal income in order to have an economic reactivation, urban and rural. And on the other hand, we need to reinforce this kind of experience, of experience sorry. We need to reinforce uh, another model, another model of agriculture with farmers that promote uh, work in the fields and that produce um, healthy, healthy food and fair prices. That is the agriculture of future. It should uh, not be forgotten that family agriculture produce 70% uh, of the world's food on 25% of the land, while governments produce 25% and concentrate 70% of the land. In Argentina, during confinement, the consumption of agroecological products multiplies, especially in large cities. Uh, uh, one of these organizations, uh, La Unión, Unión de Trabajadores de la Tierra, the Earth Workers uh, Union, is preparing to create a new colony in the town located 300 kilometers from Buenos Aires, with permission to use uh, fiscal lands. So that is a very important experience. We have to build a new rurality, a model that the pandemic has uh, updated, I think. Um, to wrap things up, uh, what is in your opinion is needed for a just systemic transition, uh, not only in Latin America, but worldwide, to build maybe a future based on uh, caring for all life? And also, what kind of dialogues do we need to have and what kind of bridges do we need to build? Yeah, uh, it's not only solidarity. <laughs> Uh, we should uh, we, we should fight against the dystopic narrative that paralyzes political imagination. Uh, I convince uh, that the return to normalcy is an acceleration to the capitalism of chaos, more social injustice, uh, more concentration, more extractivism, and ecological collapse more xenophobia and expansion for the stream rights. So we need, we need to create a new alliances to activate a political imagination and demand, demand these reforms mobilized from below or from the bottom to contribute to cultural and political consensus. It's not enough to support the local experience now. It's necessary, I think, to build uh, bridges in order to create uh, global and national uh, programs of transition. Uh, I guess that's all the time we have today. Thanks a lot, Maristella. And we will be back uh, next Wednesday, uh, August the 5th, at 3 p.m. Central European time with Professor V.K. Ramchandram of the Kerala Government State Planning Commission to discuss the response to the coronavirus in that Indian state and why having socialists, socialists in power makes a difference during the crisis. Thanks a lot, Maristella, and thanks to everyone who was with us today. See you next time.